Hey everyone, uh, my name is Dave. Uh, Oscar invited me to uh, do something on this track a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so hopefully there's something coherent in here. Uh, I'm a little under the weather today, so I can't actually tell. So you can tell me afterwards if you brought some tomatoes, maybe a good time to use them. Uh, if you're feeling a little tired, it could be a good time for a nap. I don't know. Um, so a little bit of background on me, and then we'll dive into the, the subject at hand. Um, oh, and I should add in a refreshing change of pace, I'm actually not a middleware vendor. Check that out. Um, and the big green button is not doing anything. There we go. So there's a little bit of background. I've been working in the industry now for about 25 years in design, production, and studio leadership. Cut my teeth on edutainment products in the 90s at Learning Company. Heard that uh, there was such a thing as games on the internet. Spent about five years at Pogo, uh, designing and producing web games. Built and ran their uh, digital download service. Uh, started PopCap's first remote studio in San Francisco, where I was put into Plants vs. Zombies as Crazy Dave, thereby using up 14 minutes and 59 seconds of my 15 minutes of fame. Thank you for joining me for the last remaining moment. <sighs> Immortal. Uh, was an early employee and design director at Zynga, and then an executive producer and creative director at Playdom, helping them pivot into Facebook games and casual games. Uh, for the last five years, I have been running a company that I, I founded called Mobile Game Doctor. Uh, we're basically a bunch of really senior game designers that parachute into projects at all states of development, mostly on the mobile free-to-play side, help folks figure out thorny design problems, plug over. So, why do we make games? Well, uh, speaking for myself and hopefully for all of you, we make games because we love games. Because Honestly, we could make a lot more money doing something else. But even though we do it because we love it, it turns out that making money is kind of useful, right? Um, so thinking about how are you going to, at a base level, extract revenue from your players is a really relevant question, right? And one of the things I like to do in terms of the way that I learn and process information is kind of look for big themes and schemas that I can put these things into, right? Um, and as we know, if you're working in mobile these days, you're working in free-to-play, you're giving your game away, trying to come up with compelling reasons for people to part with their money, All right, which is a good challenge. Monetization can be kind of complicated. We're going to hear a lot today about real-time psychometrics, about fraud prevention, about managing your ad waterfall. It's way too much for me. I like simple stuff, big bold strokes, frameworks I can work with. So. I took a step back and had to think about, look, what is it that we can actually sell to players effectively? How does it fit into a framework and a hierarchy? What are the success patterns we've seen over and over and over for actually getting players to monetize and free-to-play games? So I thought deeply about what the answer might be, and it turned out it was caps. The expected result, of course. Um, so this is a little framework, right? It's a, a little acronym I came up with that I'll, I'll walk everybody through. Um, and I should give a quick tip of the hat to Gabe Zickerman. This is somewhat derived from some of his work on gamification and incentive programs that work there and how, but with some pretty significant twists over the last few years. Um, it's also worth noting that these kind of four purchase categories or purchase motivations exist in a fairly strict hierarchy in terms of how much revenue they can drive per player. And they also fit pretty neatly into established ways of looking at player psychology and motivation, things like Amy Jo Kim's online interaction matrix or Richard Bartle's taxonomy of multiplayer players. Right? Hopefully these are somewhat familiar diagrams to you if you play it all in the, the game design space. Um, so let's take a quick look at each of the four letters in the acronym, see what they're about, what they do, how they get you there, what your game needs to have. So the C stands for cosmetics, right? And it's very intentionally put at the low end of the spectrum. Uh, at Mobile Game Doctor, we work with big companies like King, we work with little bitty indies, and uh, often 
I run into folks who say, you know, when I ask them how they're planning on monetizing their game, we're going to do it through cosmetics. It's usually a fatally flawed assumption. It doesn't work particularly well. In fact, a quick look at the top 100 will show you that there are literally zero mobile-only games in the top 100 grossing slots that monetize principally through cosmetics. There are a few cross-platform ones. You'll actually see a couple of screenshots in here, but zero mobile-only games. So cosmetics, quick definition, these are non-functional items, right, that are principally intended to play in a personal expression and creative space. They're going to allow you to look cool, make something cool, not do too much beyond this. And this really is kind of the original free-to-play monetization, right? If you sort of think back to MapleStory, right? Which is very strict about not selling advantage, right? This is sort of where it all kicked off. These may be items that you're going to use to decorate your avatar. They may be full player skins. They may be bits and pieces that you're going to use to assemble something cool that you're going to show off to your friends. Right. Um, why did I not put Fortnite in here? Hang on, I'll get to it. For your game to successfully sell cosmetics at all, it's got to meet a couple of design filters. And I'm actually going to roll out the less important one first, because why not? That's what I'm doing with the main hierarchy. So the first is one I call visibility. Um, it's really hard to sell cosmetics in a context where you can't see what you've achieved with them. Right? This is actually a screenshot from Apex Legends. As you might have guessed from the name of my company, I'm mostly focused on mobile, also from the way I talk about stuff. Obviously, this is a PC game. But let me ask you a question. In this picture, do I look like a badass? I don't know. <laughs> Right? So me being able to see me is a secondary success criteria. The more I can see myself, the more I care about what I look like. But the primary success criteria really is socialness, right? It's my ability to be seen by other players who can give me recognition for being creative, for having made something outstanding, right? And that means either having a game where this is inherent in something like a virtual world, or creating real incentives for players to go out of their way to interact in more single player spaces, like the classic visiting loops from the Ville games. Right. In terms of those taxonomies we talked about earlier, this plays into the self-expression quadrant, right? And largely socializers. These are people who want to be seen doing cool stuff. They care about seeing being seen by their peers. A stands for access, right? Access is all about getting at content, right? So sometimes this is just about skipping through the grind, right? This is my current game in heyday. I'm not going to tell you how many months I have been trying to save up without paying to get from 56,000 to 68 or 75,000 to build the next cool thing, but I'll give you a hint. It's a lot, right? So. For me, I want to be able to play and interact with those things, not even so much because they drive my economy, but because they're a shiny new thing. All right? So this is an access sale if I monetize for that. Another typical one that's been with us since the beginning of Western free-to-play is really looking at play limitations in terms of things like energy or live systems, right? I want to play more. I want to keep going, right? This again is kind of a third tier sale. Right, in terms of ability to monetize per user, um, but it can be effective. Uh, what we're seeing more and more of in the modern mobile space is access to exclusive content. Right? All the interactive fiction games that we're seeing, like Choices and Episodes, really lean into this. So you can see here, right, that avatar of me, which I must say, striking likeness. Right? Uh, has just been asked by a cute girl if I want to go stargaze with her. So I can say no for free, or I can, you know, pay a little money and uh, see what happens from there, right? It's exciting, it's titillating, and I know it's stuck behind a paywall. It's fairly effective. Um, you'll also see this really frequently in VIP programs, right? This is a screenshot of the, the VIP programs from Big Fish Games, where if you are a level 11 VIP, which means, by the way, that you spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars in the game, now you get access to exclusive slot machines that there's literally no other way to access. 
So, what does your game need to have to actually make this work? So, compelling content, players actually have to care about seeing the next thing. They have to go through that grind. And what I call leveraged content, right? At the end of the day, we have a couple of important equations, right? Everybody's always thinking about CPI versus LTV. What does it cost us to bring a user in versus to, you know, uh, what can we get from them in terms of, of lifetime revenue? But I, spend, I have spent a lot of time and done a lot of work and honestly failed on some things early in my career in free-to-play by not thinking about what does it take to create content. What do we get in terms of revenue out of that content? How much time does it take us to build versus for players to consume? And how do we sort of build up that tremendous labor force that's going to let us get it? It's a lot easier to leverage, say, a Candy Crush level than a full story out of choices, right? Where a tremendous amount of labor goes in, so you need to make sure that you've got a huge workforce. You've got very strong revenue generation out of each of those new stories that launches. You also need a tightly balanced economy. Uh, economy design and getting that right is a complicated problem, depending on the genre you're working in. We actually find ourselves doing a lot of work in idle games, where the math gets fairly brain explodey pretty quickly. Um, getting it right is a bit of both an art and a science. Uh, one of the best examples I've seen recently, actually, is the balance in Coin Master which does a brilliant job of stranding you just short of where you want to be to preserve your resources sort of going into the next round of play. Um, when I finish my energy, most of the time I'm at least 75% of the way through my next village and thinking about monetizing just to complete it so it doesn't get raided and destroyed. This appeals to Amy Jo Kim's Explorers and also, shockingly, Richard Bartle's Explorers, right? This is really about players who want to make the map, who want to see everything, who want to experience what your game has to offer. The P stands for power. So, power in any PvP game is about getting that subtle little edge to defeat your opponents, right? Players who are out there playing stuff that's PvP geared, things like Golf Clash, Clash Royale, are definitely strongly driven by competitive motivations. Being able to goad them into spending a little bit to get a little bit of a power edge works really well. Kind of selling victory outright generally doesn't, but enabling players to pay a little cash to, to get a little bit of edge in terms of their power curve. Right, especially a durable edge has worked well. Um, this works to a lesser extent in single player games where you're really working with a difficulty curve. So things like level based progression games, Candy Crush Saga, right, where you have <coughs> levels that are balanced to be punishing, right, to be barely doable if at all. Giving yourself a few extra moves or a couple of extra power ups to get through it again is that power cell that will typically give you a higher revenue per user than just selling the access, selling the additional lives. So, to sell this kind of power, what do you actually need to have? So, PvP and grind progression is a, a canonical example, right? Here's a little screenshot from Clash Royale. When you spend to upgrade in Clash Royale, which has a really well-balanced grind economy, right, really stiffs you on that gold currency over time, you're generally upgrading your unit by 10%. It's a durable upgrade. You're not paying just once to smite your foe, but to get that little bit of edge that takes your zap spell from leaving around some low health goblins onto wiping them all out, right? It's a worthwhile purchase, and with their well-balanced currency system, they've been able to drive huge amounts of purchase volume out of it. Um, your balance needs to be right if you're on the single player side, right? You need to be delivering a proper sawtooth difficulty curve that provides players with lots of easy, relaxed gameplay and then periodic challenges that are going to motivate them to monetize so that they know that they can get on to the easy, relaxed gameplay that comes after that. This goes to competitors. We're in Bartle's taxonomy killers, right? Players who want to demonstrate dominance, usually over the game. Or usually, sorry, over other players. Thank you, low-grade fever. Uh, and the S, really the highest 
monetization motivation that we see, right? Working on a consistent basis is for status, right? This is really about taking your level of achievement and making it highly publicly visible, right? Such that other players are going to tend to react to you in meaningful ways. So this comes in the form of things like leaderboards, which may be global, they may be social. You may notice I'm not anywhere on this global leaderboard, but I kind of do show up on the social leaderboard, a little self-esteem boost, right? And also a different kind of competitive feeling in a different target market. This goes heavily after folks that are trying to prove dominance worldwide. I just want to be better than a couple of my buddies. For this to work, Generally, you want easily encapsulated progression tiers, right? So it has to be fairly easy for players to talk about how far they've gotten in that journey. Um, I'm a daily Hearthstone player, have been for about five years. And whenever somebody sees me playing Hearthstone, right, sitting in a bar, the first question that always comes up is, what rank are you playing at? It's an easy, compact status question. Right? And, you know, I, I feel totally inadequate for being a rank five player and all these people are like, oh, wow, that's really, that's badass. I'm a rank 12 player. <clears throat> you need visibility across whatever is a meaningful social network for your audience. The more casual your audience is, the more that tends to be about their friend circle. The more hardcore it is, the more it's about a community of common interest and like skill level. And one of the ways that you can really power this up and bring in, I think, extremely strong additional motivations is by turning this into a group versus group competition, right? So things like leading clans, where players are ousted or feel pressure, right, if they're not spending, right, they've got to get in, is an extremely potent motivator and actually helps you open up beyond just the competitors, but also into the collaborators that are strongly driven by senses of social commitment or desires to support and interact positively with other players. Obviously, this all sort of goes at the achiever quadrant for Bartles, right, folks who want to be at the very top of it. These don't all necessarily work just in isolation. Look, you can get combo points. One of my favorite current monetization schemes that's doing a great job of driving revenue, I think everyone's kind of familiar with, is the Fortnite Battle Pass, right? Which is a really, really elegant system that I just want to pick apart very briefly before my time runs out and the little light turns red. So, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, to get a battle pass, you have to pay a monthly fee, uh, equivalent to about 10 bucks in Fortnite. We're sorry, it's every six weeks, every season. When you do, you start to earn lots of prizes based on how far you progress. But to earn these cosmetics, you still got to play the game. You still got to win victories. You still got to kill opponents, right? So the only way to get these unique high-end items that project status and identity as a top player is you know, you earn the cosmetic, you earn the status through the grind, demonstrating that same kind of prowess that you get off a, a global leaderboard. So in summary, uh, when you're working on your game and you're thinking about how you want to make some money, be sure to bring some caps, all right? Cosmetics, access, power, status, and try to remember that they do live in a real hierarchy. If you are a single player game that's planning on monetizing off cosmetics with low socialness and low visibility, it's probably not gonna work. Frankly, if you're on mobile and cosmetics is your plan, it's probably not gonna work, period. I don't know if we have any time for questions because I'm very verbose, but I am going to be around all day today and tomorrow, so find me or hit me up at these coordinates. It's all very good. We can go for some questions, and thank you very much for that. So, uh, thanks to Dave. Uh, anyone got any questions off the top of their mind, or shall I? Oh, there's one at the back there. Um, I'm going to try to come to you. Um, so, just two seconds. We need the mic so that uh, we can... Oh, actually, that's going to be tough. Um, can I get you to pass the mic across? Mic is coming away. Thank you. That was
was awesome. Good collaboration. Hi, so um, I had a question about how you uh, said that the different monetization tactics had like lived in a sort of hierarchy. So um, I'm kind of interested in like gacha games and stuff like that. So I was wondering how um, if you tie in like some sort of power um, boost up over your opponents to like a factor of RNG, uh, how that would change the um, hierarchy, if at all. So it's interesting. I was involved in a discussion with kind of a bunch of game company CEOs about the question of impact of gacha on monetization. And one of the things that's really true about gacha, loot boxes, whatever you want to call them, right, is they are not a monetization mechanic in the same way that these are in terms of addressing player needs. They are a way of kind of rationing rewards using a random distribution, right? So what is underlying the gacha has to be important and relevant to the player, right? Most typically, if you're looking at something like a mid-core game, it's going to be power, where you're gonna to try to get all the shards of the new badass character that's just been released as the game ratchets power creep up and up and up, right? Um, our overall estimate is if you sort of remove that and go back to direct purchase, which is where we were all at four or five years ago, right, before Gotcha really hit the West in a big way, it would be a significant but non-fatal impact to revenue, probably in the 30% range. But, you know, if you do have something that's really desirable for the player, if you can hide it behind that kind of probability table and get that sort of variable reward, right, and variable interval reinforcement, which is really kind of powerful from a, a straight behavioral psychology perspective, you can certainly get a nice bump on that. Does that make sense? Thank you. Sure. I like that. Gacha is a way of ration, uh, rationing res, um, rewards. That was a really it is. Nice it's quote. an amplifier, right? It's not an inherent goal in itself. How many people go into a game saying, I want to buy a loot box today? <laughs> okay, not so many hands. Not so many now. Uh, any, any more questions? On that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. All right. Uh, I think David deserves an extra round of applause for doing all that at short notice as well. So.